and you go tell your regional numbering authority that it's going to be done and they have to approve it. So that's some big number deals going on to get those remaining uh, slash uh, sorry, IPv IPv4 um, addresses. Um, but to back to your question about segmenting, if you had a building in one of those satellites, you give each a slash 64, connect them up with a router, and they'd be just like you would today. Um, with an with a IPv4 network, you do the same subnetting to segment your network segments so that things like the multicast packets won't flood and reflect off each other. Okay. So I'll say you had your, your satellite and you go back to the main office with a VPN and then that would have a set of slash 64s or bigger or smaller depending on how it ends up working out. The, the, uh, the part of the reason why a network is so big is there's a core problem with IPv4. It's called the routing table growth size. So um, on the more the math side of networking for um, IPv4 and v6, each network, let's call it an autonomous system, an AS, that connects to each other. So then there's what are called peering agreements. So Bright House, for example, connects to Verizon, which connects to L3, which connects to AT&T, and they pass network between each other. And they use routers to do that. So basically, let's say this is a, a very simple network. If you have, let's say, a bunch of customers right here, and you call this ISP1 to 2, when these customers hit your edge router on ISP1, it would, it would have a list of, let's call this 3 and 4. It'd have, in its routing table, I know how to get to 1, 2, 3, and 4. And it will pick, this is the path to go on. And that's a basic routing table. The issue that we're running into with IPv4 is because there's so many networks, and it's, the numbering's been very inconsistent. It's so fragmented that the routing tables are humongous in size. So where IPv6 ends up ha making more sense and being easier is because it's being distributed out in a much more organized fashion. These routing tables are supposed to get smaller and there should be less of these networks existing that need to be routed in between. So the uh, how, how is this affect things like BGP and OSPF? This is this is all what BGP ends up doing. Because BGP says, what are my neighboring autonomous systems and what should I prefer over the rest? What BGP ends up having a problem with is when there's so many that you fill up your router's routing table and you're just screwed. And that's the issue facing IPv4 at the moment. Now, because IPv6 is much more hierarchical based, you would have an ISP, let's say you're the DOD, you have a slash 13, everybody knows how you get to your slash 13. And you will end up hiding the individual routes that you segmented out your network to. So you don't have to broadcast on BGP, okay, I have a bunch of slash 24s that are all individually disconnected out and everybody needs to have an entry for that. You just have your slash 13 and you're done. And there's, um, so there is a concept of regionally tied space. So you're in America, you're in Florida, you're in China. That distribution of IP addresses. And then there are other ones which are called geographically independent um, allocations. So let's say you're IBM or HP. I, I'm huge, whatever. I will have an allocation that's equally big as I am that everybody knows how to get to through my various edge routers around the world. And then they're all connected together on their back end systems and stuff. And there's, they're being a lot stricter as far as who gets that space. Like your, my, basic, my example earlier on, we had two ISPs and you're in the middle. You're either going to end up doing the IPv6 NAT, so your device is only have one IP address, or you'll actually have all your servers with two different IPv6 addresses set up depending on how you want to shape your traffic and that type of thing.
but it gives you a lot of flexibility. Um, things like IPsec are baked into the standard, so you know that everybody's going to have support for that. And that's, that's when IPsec was built was IPv6. Yes, and it was retrofitted onto IPv4, and everybody never really implemented it. <laughs> I think it's, it's more common to see an SSL VPN, right? Not a IPsec one? Well, not in my, not my company, but... Oh, you guys are all IPsec? Cisco is more IPsec. Cisco also does a lot of SSL, though. It all depends on what you want to fight with and what's broken today or compromised or whatever else. Um, any questions? Firewalling. Yes. It just um, works as, you would, as it normally does. It's a safe firewall. Let's see if I can figure out what my question is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's moot. Never mind. Well, a common I think I see how the stuff would work. A common firewall question is how would you firewall all these different addresses yeah. versus NAT today where you just say deny all? And it's the same type of thing. If you have an IPv6 firewall, you would basically say deny everything external to the network. And it's fairly simple to the firewall to figure out this is my addressing internal versus external, lock it all off. Yeah. It just assumes 64 is internal. Well, it'd be whatever you configure it to be. Like if it's, if it's an, an edge router on a large network, you can figure it according to that. The, uh, it, Actually, an interesting problem that uh, I read a news article about every so often is that because everybody's kind of doing IPv6 and uh, fits and spurts, a lot of the security products don't scan for IPv6. So, and any modern, especially well, yeah, any any modern computer you plug into the network is going to ask for an IPv6 address from the local switch. And if you haven't locked it down or set it up the way and set up your connectivity. You have a mini network going on there that isn't scanned or audited, and companies throw a fit about that. However, the uh, most obvious thing that a lot of companies with like Windows networks would do is turn off IPv6. It's not supported by Microsoft anymore. Um, they don't test for it, and it will randomly break, especially newer versions of Windows, in various interesting ways. Exchange and Active Directory. Some of the newest features of Active Directory will randomly break if you turn it off in the wrong way. How is the wrong way? The, and, there's and actually there's two different interfaces to turn it off in Windows. One will disable it just on the NIC. The other will disable it box wide. Box wide will disable, I think it's zone transfers in Active Directory. Okay. I remember the exact, this is a huge knowledge base article I ran across. What was that you were saying a second ago about unchecked, unscanned networks? So basically, if you set up your networks and you don't lock it completely down, the second you take a new laptop onto the network and you plug it in, it has IPv6 by default enabled. They'll say, can I get an address? Depending on how you set up your routers, they're going to happily say, here's my, uh, here's my router advertisement and you'll end up with a set of addressing going on in your network that can communicate that may not be getting scanned by your intrusion detection or intrusion pre prevention software. Because it may not even be IPv6 aware. Yeah, even if the router doesn't send out a router advertisement, you've got the auto configuration addresses on by default in yes. all the systems, and there's multicast DNS where you can discover services on the network and you can have a whole... Oh, you can have all on. kinds of fun things. Yeah. Yeah, without the without the network people knowing about it. You said plug it in. That's that's also in reference to wireless, right? Yes. Oh, you walk in with your phone. Oh, the slashes. Huh? I forget what the slashes mm -hmm. on that one, but that's what you're talking about. So when about. you walk in with your phone, like both of them. Oh, right. The auto configuration address. Yeah. Um. Uh, well, actually, I think I can go over that one too. Yeah. Fb80 uh, is is uh, the. The link local. So, so that's every, from your device to the nearest uh, switch. Yeah, so anything on the same switch, you'll have every device will have an address that's prefixed with FE80, and uh, the rest of that number, I think, is the MAC address of the of the NIC that it's connected to. So and that stays local to that switch. It doesn't get re reset. So yeah, if you scan like a if you scan that slash. That's an actually an interesting problem that I remember running across. How do you write an IP address and the URL actually changed? 
Oh yeah, you should mention that. I don't know why I put two slashes there. Yeah, I was going to draw the number, but I forgot what the allocation So typically is. today you do HTTP colon like one two seven zero dot zero dot one, and that would be a valid URL. That's not true in IPv6 because of the colon separator. It becomes unparsable. So now you have to use an opening uh, bracket, and then yeah, whatever. One. And a closed bracket to actually designate the numeric IP address. So, because an additional colon, although most people might not experience this, it would be the port number. Yes. Outside um, of the square bracket. Yes. I, I mean, believe you can do 127.1 will also work for IPv4. So it'll assume the zeros in there. It, it, that, can, it, that can behave in very unexpected ways, too, because it's, a, it's converting it to octal. No, it's, it's doing some conversion and adding it in there. Yeah, well, he, no, no, I think he's talking about how you can emit numbers in IPv4, not, not that you can write in IPv. Yeah. But you can, you can write something like, uh, I don't know it, you can write a number higher than a 256 in IPv4, and it'll convert it and add in some extra numbers too if you're not careful. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I oh yeah, you can write it as a 32-bit int as well. You can write an IP address as a 32-bit uh, unsigned integer. Depending on the software, yeah. Yeah. So Windows typically doesn't like that, and it doesn't also like you skipping zeros from what I've, what I've experienced. Yes. Um, but the, where this will come into play is all the libraries that deal with uh, parsing a URL will have to be updated. Most of them, most of them have been forever. <laughs> this this type of thing is usually you find out after something's gone live. Or um, yeah. what about my work mandated IE6 standard? IE6 supported that. IE6 yeah, didn't support IPv6. It did. It? No. I thought it's well, been like, supported since um, 2000, transition. since Windows 2000. Okay, fine. It fine. might have supported it. Oh wait. Because the first IPv6 support was Windows XP Service Offici Pack 2. Officially. But I, I, know pe I know people that are using IPv6 uh, in the Netherlands on Windows computers in like 2000. Really? Yeah. So, I don't know. Native IPv6 connections 13 years ago. Well, it's the death of XP will be a very interesting thing since it goes off support next year. And most places are probably not ready for um, it. Just the, this cross, it's not a clock now. I don't know. We don't necessarily have any limits here, but. Um, I'm cool with any questions if anybody has any more. I'm, I'm I, have a, I could have a brief uh, descri a description of uh, how you can use OpenVPN with this. Go for it. Awesome. Probably is there, there is a. You didn't get to do your projector bit stuff. Yes, there is a projector. Oh, I actually have two things. Did you talk about, you didn't talk about the local addresses. So no, I'm not as familiar with them. You, sorry, you need local addresses. Um, I want to address one thing before I actually bring up the projector. Which I'll bring up in just a second. Uh, so Brian. You asked, you have a corporate network that spans multiple places, yeah. and say you don't have a budget, like to, to or an action, you don't need a budget, but say you don't, for whatever reason, political probably, you don't want to get your own allocation of public IPv6 address space. Like, you don't need your own allocation of public IPv6, IPv6 address space, because none of the ISPs you're talking to right now support... Um, support IPv6, That's but you still short. want to have a VPN, and you want to have, you don't want to ever have to worry about addresses again. That's very short-sighted of the VPIT, but I expect that from him. So, <laughs> carry on. So, um, what you can do is you can run a VPN, an IPv6-only VPN, and you can have your own slash 48 um, in an address space that they've designated as unique local addresses. There's no registration system for this, but that company he mentioned, 6xs.net, uh, runs an unofficial registration so that you can register your own um, private IP address space. Uh, but it's, it's registered so luckily anyone using the same system won't conflict with you. So what this means is, is when your company has, and the reason this you could sell having to be IPv6 only internal network is, when your company eventually gets bought by some other company, if that other company was as forethought to have uh, has uh, as forward thinking to have an IPv6 only VPN, you can just merge. You can just have the two operating because both 
of your private IPv6 addresses are unique. Or if you were, if you do collide, you can use the IPv6 NAT mechanism yep. and to, NAT between trans the two. to translate between them yep. transparently. And you can use that same NAT once you finally get an IPv6 native connectivity to the rest of the internet. That's correct. <coughs> so, uh, but if you also if you just want to play around and you don't even want to be on the public internet with this, you can get a slash 48, which is um, I believe that's 60. I believe it's to the 64 slash 64s, something like that. I forget. It's a huge number. I believe it's 18 quintillion addresses. Um, 16 quintillion. Anyway, so my, my point here is a, a different problem. I am using IPv6 at home to, uh, to avoid having to deal with NAT. And I'd rather that. So I don't, I don't have to necessarily avoid NAT. I just don't want to deal with it. Lie. <laughs> what? Of course not. Oh. No. Is it? Yeah, it'll show up in a second. Maybe. Try it again then. It's on. Mm -hmm. I could write another one. Mm -hmm. I could do some text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like <laughs> this is, um, so what I ended up doing here, which when you, when you actually get to see my screen, <coughs> Um, I can talk about it very quickly. Uh, it's actually, I'm using OpenVPN. Oh, using OpenVPN for IPv6, if you're using a re relatively recent version, to do it in the dumbest way possible uh, is not very hard. I think there's two additional lines of configuration to a normal OpenVPN setup. Uh, that isn't the problem. What I'm going to explain to you is why this won't work if you, if you attempt doing it the way I did. I'm going to just hopefully save you what was about three days of research on my part. So, first, I just gonna, we're going to go very, very quickly. This is my a client OpenVPN. Oops. This. This is my client OpenVPN uh, config. Uh, the relevant sections that are actually important to uh, IPv6 is telling it ton IPv6. Um, did I do anything else? It's using UD. No, 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 no. All of this is not specific. This is just so. All I think I did on the client side was say ton IPv6, which creates a ton device that can handle IPv6. And then the rest of that is whatever you normally use for OpenVPN, which is a topic that if anyone's interested in, we can do at another meet. On the server side, if I'm still connected to the internet, dormant. I keep thinking that I need to like talk to uh, the Sean over here about getting a, a more reliable device that connects to Verizon's network that actually like reconnects when it loses its own connection. <laughs> 295, I think, will probably connect. But it's like, it's USB, so mm. it won't be Wi-Fi to your phone. <laughs> Sometimes that trips out. Come on. Hello, Everton. Open. Disconnected. Look at that. Well, injected. Disconnecting. Use Grease Monkey to make a little script for this page. That yeah, I have Tamper Monkey installed too, so I mean, I could totally just sit here and have it do that. All right, what's the? Uh, I'll actually connect to the local Wi-Fi. Does anyone have this, that information? Guest mm -hmm. HDR. Mm -hmm. Guest HDR is it? Mm. Guest mm -hmm. one though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guest one is the same. Okay. I just try to go to Google. Hmm. Uh, yep. One one. This series. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Awesome. I don't think I saved that on this device, but that's Chromebook. I mean, awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we actually have a connection. I don't need that open. So, obviously, HD. Yeah, I don't think you'll have this HD. 
Okay, that's not a problem either. I tried that too. Uh, you got lucky. I run uh, SSH on every port for an entire IPv4 address, <laughs> except for the one port that OpenVPN uses. So hopefully it allows out port 53, it, I, so I can actually demo this. But anyway, so here's the config file, and I'll show you the two very important lines that you need. So this is all normal stuff. As you can see, I'm running uh, OpenVPN on one of my IP addresses on port 53, which is DNS, uh, and using UDP because that's a normal port for me to want to get out to from somewhere. But that's not important. What is important is these two lines at the bottom. I uh, tell it that my server has uh, a block of 64 addresses. Uh, I actually want to do a 48, but my so how this is working in the background is I use a Linode. Linode has native IPv6 support. I have two allocations of 64, so this is my VPN 64 uh, from Linode. So I tell it to that I have this pool, and I tell it to route everything through uh, through that uh, everything. And now this is the entire IPv6 address space right here that's currently allocated. Unless I'm wrong. Cool. And uh, and I tell it to route it through the IPv6 address of the of the Linode itself. Or of the start of the starting address, um, something like that. So I found these instructions, uh, and I found several people doing this several different ways, and there were more complicated things, and and it wasn't working. So how I mean it wasn't working. That I should discuss the failure mode. The failure mode was I was running this open VP, open VPN thing, um, and I was able to get to this thing, and it wasn't forwarding my traffic. If you've ever done anything with with, NAT, with routing in Linux, you know that it's really simple. You just do, you like echo. I don't know if I have it in here. William, you know what the, what the syntax is? It's something like echo, sys, net. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to do? You echo one into the forwarding file for IPv4, right? Proxys, yes. proc. net, IPv4. Yep. So the same thing exists, and I actually do this in sysctl. No, but here's where you're going to get screwed up. So you find out that this, you have to do this, and unless you read in a very specific point in a man page, we move that. So here I have the two interfaces. It's I did the specific for interfaces. So I turn on forwarding here, and I turn on forwarding here. When I turned on forwarding on ETH zero, and whenever you turn on forwarding on ETH zero, you, as, if you hark, if you remember back to Chomsky saying you get automatically assigned IPv6 addresses, you do. But I believe the standard requires that if you are doing forwarding on an interface, you cannot accept router advertisement, which means that your IPv6 connection to the rest of the world disappears the minute you turn that on. Three.